Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome back to the Cyber Underground, everybody. I'm Dave Stevens. Uh, can't call myself the cyber guy anymore. Still looking for a title. I've had a couple suggestions on the web. Take it easy. Uh, keep it clean. Um, <laughs> remove some of the comments. <laughs> Still looking for a title. There's a cyber guy out there that's not me. Uh, once again, I teach for the University of Hawaii, Kapiolani Community College. I teach network uh, security and ethical hacking. And today, my great honor to have uh, one of the other spin-off hosts, from uh, his, the Hibachi Talk. The Hibachi Talk. Uh, we're coming up with uh, Andrew, the security guy from Security up? Matters. Hi, Welcome. You. Aloha. Oh, Thanks man. for having me. So good to have you. We here. have a far better guest than me, though. <laughs> so let's introduce our remote guest, yes. uh, Carissa Breen of Carissa Breen Industries. Industries, yes. From Australia. Yeah, so she's calling in Aussie. from Sydney. So thanks for getting up, up on a Saturday morning over there, Carissa. Can you hear us, Carissa? Yeah, I think, yes, I can. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do out there uh, down under in that country that basically it's uh, your Americans that uh, have a better nickname for the word barbecue? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so what do you do I, down I there, that. I get Carissa? that a lot. <laughs> Uh, I actually own and run a, a cybersecurity media company as well as a communications agency servicing cybersecurity and the emerging technology industry. Wow, that's impressive because yes. uh, you look pretty young uh, and you're really conquering it out there and going on to two paths on the same channel. And uh, I t my respects to you. Uh, Australia's a huge continent. Do you cover the whole thing? Actually, we're a global media company, and I think the how, the reason how I started the business in the first place was uh, it started off with a, with a blog that I had, which was quite bad, but <laughs> I wanted to interview, it was quite bad, and I actually look back on it, and I feel a little bit like I hope no one ever sees those blogs I used to write. <laughs> yeah, once it's on but the internet, it's stay, it lives forever. It's forever, you know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially the Americans would be like, well, those Australian people are really weird. But, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, we've got no room to talk to, anymore, sorry. I, I want, <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to understand more about the minds of, you know, cybersecurity practitioners, what their th thoughts were on the industry, because it's, as you know, it's still quite an immature industry, especially within Australia. And there was a lot of talk around security, awareness, education, and then I could see a gap in the market because a lot of security companies were complaining that they couldn't really get the buy-in or the traction. And I started my career in, um, in a large bank, actually, the largest bank in Australia. And then I sort of progressed my, my career, but then ultimately going out on my own a few years later because I could see that a lot of people in security had this issue with this communications piece. And I think that wow. it's a piece that a lot of people who are super technical probably undervalue. We see it as a, a, a critical point to, to one, get the buy-in, but two, to get people to actually understand more about the industry. Okay. That's a great point. I mean, yeah. that's we, we're still today trying to convince they're trying to explain to boards of directors what cybersecurity is and why they should fund it, you know? And it's, it, unfortunately, it is technical. It's very technical. The work itself yeah. is, is fairly, I mean, you know, you have the, the phishing pieces and the social engineering pieces, which, right. but just getting through terminology. The hard work, right? the hard work is technical. It is. And but, when you uh, start talking like that, their eyes glaze job. over. We have to go from geek to human. Yeah. Right? We have to, yeah. we have to translate this for people and we have exactly. to educate them. And that, that's a difficult thing. Not a lot of people can speak both languages. Yeah. <laughs> what, so that's, it, that's interesting that you, you know, that's identified. that's the difficult part. Yeah, and you found that gap as a communication huh. gap, which is, I rarely hear it called that, but that is what it is. Yeah, it's a you know? significant gap. And it's, it would be better for people like Carissa, I think, to be in this industry uh, approaching that gap and trying to fill that gap rather than the boards of directors and CEOs and other uh, upper level executives shocking themselves awake with a breach. Which, oh yeah. You know, Starwood sure, today. Sure. I mean, Starwood, it's a huge industry, Absolutely. 500 million people. 
uh, wow, that's a huge breach. Yeah, that's my hotel chain. That's where I stay. <laughs> so I'm sure my, my credit cards are floating around. Uh, Nobody is safe, and, and it doesn't seem like uh, any of the old schoolers are listening. The younger people coming up the ladder have a little taste of this, but yeah. it, it, what Carissa's well, doing is necessary. Sure. So, uh, Carissa, how are the audiences for these events in Australia? Are they are they are you getting the old gray-headed, bald-headed <laughs> board of director guys? Us. Are they in the audience, or is it just the young techie guys? Or are you seeing uh, a, you know are you seeing a good a broad spectrum? <laughs> Definitely a broad spectrum, and I think because I, you know, people say, you know, I'm the security person, and when I first started security, everyone's like, no, you're not. And I'm like, well, you're just a girl. You're not a security person. I'm like, yeah, I am. So I think I naturally break that status quo of a security person, and I think maybe because I do break that, people are sort of willing to listen because I'm already breaking out of that mold. So there's definitely a spectrum. I feel because we have been doing this for quote-unquote long enough to sort of earn our stripes in this industry that people are willing to listen because they know that they can't communicate at a level and it's on the right discourse to the people that they want to talk to. So whether that is a technical guy, it is their customers, or it is someone from a C-suite level. And it's about changing the language about who you are talking to. And that's, that's the disconnect. And I don't feel that a lot of people in this industry quite understand the language. There's one, influential, and two, to actually get that buy to people to want to listen, because security people can be quite dismissive and very <laughs> high and mighty that they're a security person. Yes. <laughs> and forgive me, yeah. I love them because they, a lot of them are my friends. But <laughs> that is, that's a common, that's a common trait that we see globally, not just in Australia. It, it's very prominent all over the world. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, you know, the, the dismissive, and she's so polite about it. That, that, yeah. I would have we get called many worse yeah. things than that. <laughs> Just, dismissive is a kind, that's a gentle, that's a gentle descriptor. Uh, so nice of you. Uh, yeah, we can, <laughs> we can be kind of arrogant with that, and uh, it, it, that's a hard one to, to overcome, really. Well, I was going to say that it, I don't know that, I think it might come off as arrogance. We, we want to be helpful, but, but it's frustrating to explain something over and over and over why you need money and not get the money and you can explain it again and then not get the money and explain it again and not get the money and it's like hey I've warned you and warned you and warned you how many different ways can I explain it and at the end when they when the breach happens you then still they pay blamed. the money yeah. well they pay the money but they blame you yeah, oh, yeah. Why, why wasn't I prepared well because you didn't sure. cut me the check but that doesn't mean anything at that point yeah it, Absolutely. it's it's often hard for me to not only uh, convince people that this is necessary but when they do the buy-in of the C-level suite, and Carissa, tell me if this is what you encountered too. In, in my experience, what I get is a partial buy-in, and they say they want to invest in certain security products that say they cover the whole spectrum of security, and they want to hire one or two security people. And I try to tell them, no, security is a hive mentality. Yes. You have to train it's everybody. everybody across the, board. Yes. the whole team's got to be playing. Everybody's got to be in the field, or there's one person that's not playing, and that's the whole. Yes. And, and your, all your security devices that cost mm -hmm. millions of dollars are bypassed because yes. somebody clicked on a link and you didn't know it's a zero day and you're done. That's it. And there's Starwood, 500 million people, which is probably what happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, uh, I, so, so do you have, let me ask you this, Chris, have you seen a shift in, in the rooms that you're in? Is there, do you think more of a willingness for, for the C-suite to get engaged now? Rather, they, they may be moving slower, but I feel like they're moving faster and they're, they're finally listening, at least. And I would say that's been in the last 18, 24 months. It, it surely we weren't getting hardly any response no. before that. No, that. But money talks. Yeah. And there's a lot of money being lost mm. and a lot of bad PR. So, Carissa, give us your, your opinion. What's your view of this? How's it going with, uh, in your field? Yes, yeah, so I agree. There's definitely been a, an incline in people buying into it. There's still going to be that resistance and that point of contention because at the end of the day, you are talking to business executives that aren't technical people. So all they really care about is bottom line and risk. It's about how you communicate that. And I think what we're trying to do as a, as a media company is actually communicate that in ways that these people, one, care about and two, understand because... If you look at a security person's perspective, it's always going to be on the technology, and it's not really broader than that. So it's really about getting out of your own headspace and taking that upper level to be like, what's important to these guys? Reverse engineering their thoughts as well. I have seen an uptake, 
But again, it's still it's incredibly immature and it's further behind than you guys are in the US. And that's why we are trying to build that communication, the awareness and education around what this actually means. Because security is actually even to consumers. And consumers are the people that make up these businesses that effectively are spearheading these business from you know a, a, a CIO point of view or a CEO point of view. And it's about understanding from a psychological point of view what makes them tick and then how to, I guess, contrive the, the, the language to get them to get the buy-in. The reason why it's been such a slow uptake is because people are just trying to do a blanket statement to every single person and that's not working mm. because you can't communicate right. to every single person <laughs> the same type of language. <laughs> right, and uh, 100% I hundred percent agreed. I also feel that the it, it's also hard to communicate. Once you do get by, and it's hard to. And Carissa, <laughs> tell me if this is wrong. It's incredibly <laughs> difficult to get people to accept the change in a threat landscape. So, based on current events, cool. some businesses have to change their threat landscape based on changing threats to their business model. And not every business has the same yes. threats, right? So how do you get people to change exactly. and tell them, yep, thank you for buying, thank you for telling me security is important, here's your name on this, but now we need to make a change because global events have changed your threat landscape. Mm. I was wondering if the, is the government active, uh, the Australian government in supporting business cybersecurity problems in Australia? Yes, they are. They are, but again, I don't think it's, again, communicated in a way that people really care. It's like, oh, yeah, security. And then everyone just looks at it, acknowledges it, and then dismisses it. Because the, the issue is no one's giving people a reason to really care about it. Because I don't, you know, do you guys really care about other particular problems? Because, like, unless it's your industry, you don't really care. But if you can give people ways to care that's relevant to mm. them, they're going to care. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, and I that think that's just human nature. Everyone's just like, <laughs> security. Oh, absolutely. And that's the thing. But security people can be a little bit tunnel vision and think, oh, well, I'm the security guy and it's all about this. But at the end of the day, it, you need to understand the, the differences between what people actually care about and understand from a psychological point of view what makes them tick. And it, it, it's still, going, and that's what we're noticing now because the, people are saying that there was a report done in Australia for CIOs and ESOs, and the biggest concern they had was actually not the technology or the te technical skills. It was about communication, training, education, and awareness. They, to me, all come under communication piece. Mm. Yeah, I agree. That is the toughest part, educating your users and getting the buy-in from every level of the organization. And also, the, there's a component of communication that's persistent. You know, how do you keep it top of mind? Right, you can't every, just do, not fire once and forget. Right, every right, yeah. every link that you look at, every Absolutely. email that you get, like you really got to be thinking from a security mindset. That's what's difficult to communicate is the persistence of it, you know? I see that in businesses uh, <clears throat> currently right now, they try to save money by overtasking people and using people for multiple tasks at the same time. Sure. And that overtasking, I think, uh, creates kind of a, a security apathy because they just want to do their job. Yeah, yeah. They just got to uh, go through 200 emails a day. <laughs> and, and when they get a link, they're going to yeah. click on it, right? Sure. And so overtasking can be part of the problem. And then again, you're hitting the bottom line profits. Okay, we got a break for uh, one minute. I think we're okay. right at the break, so let's take a break and uh, pay some bills. We'll be right back, everybody. Until then, stay safe. Aloha. This is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha.
Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Welcome back, everybody. I'm the former Dave the Cyber Guy. Dave the Professor. <laughs> Dave the Professor. <laughs> OK, that's cool. Well, let's go with the Professor. Uh, we're, we're here with uh, Andrew the Security Guy and uh, hey, Carissa everybody. Breen. Aloha. Um, aloha, everybody. And we're back. Uh, we're talking remote with Carissa. So she's on the phone. We just got to. Yeah, we're trying to get a really trying to get a feel for what's happening on the cyber side in Australia. And it sounds similar to what's happening here. You know, Chris, I heard you mention you thought maybe we were at kind of ahead of, of what you've seen there. And I, I feel like we're behind almost everybody else I talk to in North America. There's, I, I feel like one out of every 10 companies is doing something and nine of them aren't. Well, you know, the message of our current administration mm -hmm. is to pull back. I don't know if you know this, Carissa, but uh, right now the Trump administration just cut funding for the National Institute of Secu uh, Standards yeah, NIST, and Technologies. Yeah. They took $6 million out of next year's budget, and NIST is our standards organization for things like the 800-171 and 800-53 that, that help us audit organizations and make them more secure, including the DOD, the sure. Department of Defense. Ridiculous. So uh, mm -hmm. the current administration, Carissa, here in the United States is actually kind of working against us. Uh, we can go and get the information as small and medium business owners, but it's on us to create a plan to implement those strategies. Mm -hmm. And really, no one's coming back to us and auditing us from the government saying, hey, are you no, actually complying? Not at all. Yeah. Is, is the government active in the audit? Like, like do, you, do they take care of like your electrical you know, grid and your, your wastewater treatment facilities, for example? Are they working on your critical infrastructure from a cyber perspective, or is that left to the businesses themselves? in Australia? Probably two parts of this. Yes, they are, and then they aren't. I think that they are, I, I guess, quote-unquote, campaigning to do more of that because they can see that if it's tied to the government, people need to have a level of compliance. So if it's not, people aren't going to really do much, and that's why they're trying to implement that because people need to be held accountable. And obviously, you've got government bodies auditing, like, financial institutions and things like that. And that's why that's important, because if, if it's not, then I think that people would just go a little rogue and just kind of do whatever, because they're not being audited. They're not being held responsible or accountable for any of these potential risks that, you know, could potentially damage their customers and, and their business reputation as well. And I would think it would be sort of, because it's, it's not as big. There's, I think you said there were 22 million across um, Australia. 32 million, right? 32 million. Yeah. So, so 22, but 22. correct me if I'm wrong, so someone might call me out and say it's 24 or something. Yeah, so, <laughs> so let's just say 25 million. But, <laughs> but it's definitely, it's small <laughs> enough, that that. It, yeah, small enough that it could be done. It's like the, you know, there's more people like I think in California than that. Uh, yeah, there's almost twice as yes. many people in California. Yes. Yeah. So, so, in, so in other words, it would seem that you know for the government could could really with some not heavy hands, but weigh in pretty quickly to have a broad effect on a population that size. Well, they need to you set know, a good example, I think, first. Yeah, leading definitely. by example is something that even our government needs to do. We've had so many breaches and and so That's many true. shutdowns already. But uh, you know, once you lead by example, then you share that information with others and say, "Look, this is how we're accomplishing yeah. the task. It's this easy. Ask us for help." And I think organizations in the U.S. are trying to help. Look at InfraGuard with the FBI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're attempting it. Are the um is it, so does insurance play in in Australia? Do they have um like cybersecurity insurance? Is that a popular thing now? Mm -hmm. Is it that's being adopted, or is it is it available or not available? I guess is the question. It's available, and there's probably two responses to this. So the first one is, yay, cyber insurance. It's a safety blanket. <laughs> yeah, but then other right. people are like, oh, well, you're not really implementing very good security then. So it then yeah. becomes this, this, you know, almost a Mexican standoff because people are like, oh, well, you're not really implementing good security controls and practices because you're just going to rely on the insurance. <laughs> so the insurance says, yeah, but... 
what if you get breached? What are you going to do, Mr. Client? But, so it's kind of this awkward talk uh, you know, around, I guess, the security table about what, what do we do about this? Mm. And so it's something that is becoming, I guess, more commoditized now because insurance companies are adopting to it. But there's still the issue is how do you underwrite for that as well? And I mean, I think something in Lloyd's in London, they've come up with a framework. But again, it's still quite an immature place because how do you underwrite for that? Because everyone's at different levels. And I think it's not going to be a one size fits all because you can't commoditize that because everyone, it's quite a bespoke problem because everyone's at different stages, maturity levels, have different levels of risk attached to them as well. I yeah, agree. It's, it's tough for small and medium business owners yeah. to implement a level of security. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're different. You've actually implemented a, a tremendous amount of security in your organization. For, for well, the government, to do government work here, you've got, there's some, we have guidance here for government contractors right. in the defense industrial base mm -hmm. space. Uh, you've so done a lot of that's that That's a little right? different, but the, I still think that her point's well made because they, they, the, the actuarial tables on cyber are difficult. I've seen, just for example, I've seen cybersecurity applications that ask nine questions. And then I've seen what I would consider real ones wow. that ask about 300 questions. So very in depth, you know, and those, so that's, I think, someone who's giving you, actually really ensuring the level of risk that your organization represents versus yeah. the six question ones are absolutely ludicrous. You well, know, if you look at I wouldn't a, trust that insurance at all to cover any six questions. Well, it, it would be difficult that's to file concerning. any cybersecurity uh, claim. Sure. Right. Any cybersecurity insurance claim right now is going to force an incident response. Yes. And that IR team is going to come to your business and they're going to do some forensics and they're going to find out, in their opinion, was that your fault? Right. And if you haven't implemented one of those standards like 800-171 and have a professional company come in and third party like yes. audit you, then they can pretty much say, no, it was your fault. That that's your only defense is using one of those standards. Yeah, I wouldn't give them the logs. I would definitely keep a copy. <laughs> Make sure it's <laughs> defensible. It up, you right, know, yeah, whatever yeah. defense you're putting in, you better be monitoring. So it. I understand about the cybersecurity insurance. Uh, to do business in the state, my company has to have cyber insurance. Sure. But I've read it. I think that if I filed a claim, it would be tough for me to get money. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think that's the way they're set up currently. Oh, right? Yeah. There's a lot of holes in them. There's, and yeah. is that has that been a recent? Yeah. Um, has, has cyber insurance been available? And I'll show you like for for five years, or is it just like in the past year? I don't know. Five years. I've only really heard of it coming into practice probably the last eighteen months. Yep. But again, it's oh, still something that is not adopted. And to your point, I heard someone say the other day they had cyber security insurance, something stuffed up, but then they weren't covered for something. So there is a lot of discrepancy yeah. between we get the insurance, but uh, yeah, so by the way, we're not covered for that. So that's what I mean by there's, a, there's still a, a lack in the process of that framework around how to underwrite for it, because the last thing you want to do is have a problem and then, oh, sorry, you're not covered for that, and no one cares about yeah. that. So I yeah. think that... That is, that's a problem. I yeah, think for sure. This is a, this is a, a neat example of, of pieces of technology that have come into companies throughout history. If you just look through the 20th century, every time we adopted a new technology, uh, driving in cars and trucks and, and highway rules and uh, driver's licenses and, and air travel and air shipping and, and um, you know, each time we get more technology, we have to shift our business model somehow to compensate for that. Mm -hmm. And then we have to shift our policies, our procedures, our safety measures, and uh, how are we going to ensure mm -hmm. that? And how do we reduce our risk and reduce our liability on that? Mm -hmm. And here's a new industry we're adding, and we're just mm -hmm. going through the growing pains just like every other technology that we've added. Mm -hmm. So you think we'll get there? I think we'll get there. Absolutely. And then we'll add another technology, and we'll be at a loss again. Well, how long did it take? So how long, when did we get seat belts in the U.S., like 1974? Oh, that's Ralph Nader's area, right? Yeah. That's 66, But it was in 67. the 70s, right? Before uh, there was actually a law. Right. I think the Corvair was the impetus, right? Remember it, the Chevy Corvair? Oh, yeah. And it saved lives. But do you, do you have, have a seat belt law in Australia? Yes? Yes, absolutely. And is it, is it, did it predate the U.S., or was it after us, or do you know? 
Look, I don't know. It's probably after because you're pretty behind here on every single front, so it's probably after. <laughs> but you do get massively fined if you are if you're found without a seatbelt. Wow. So, really? So they take it seriously. Okay, I mean, you know, it's just so, again, we're regulation. I mean, they fought it here for years. The automakers fought it. Yeah. And I'm wondering yeah. if industry, because of the expense, because implementing good cyber practices is not inexpensive. Oh, they will fight it. Doing persistent sure. audits is not, you know, inexpensive. And so the cost of business, I mean, I think ultimately when we can pass this on to the consumers at all levels, of course, we'll, we'll graduate to hardened business. Our, our government is talking about <laughs> purchasing uncompromised, right? They want the solutions that are provided to them to be uncompromised. And currently they're mm. saying they want that at the same cost. So I don't understand how that occurs. That's not going to happen. Because they've, they've not been buying it hardened, and now you want it hardened at the same cost. I don't see how business can deliver that. So I think IoT will be the impetus. Uh, you talk IoT? About the, yeah, the Internet of Things, the, the little devices mm. that we have that are barely secured now. I call it but, the Internet of Theft. <laughs> but, you know, people like the, the organizations like oh my the, UL, the Underwriters Laboratories, uh, they're coming out with the new standards, yep. right? And that will force IoT to be more secure. But you're right. It's going to get passed on to the consumers. Is um, That's a good question. Do you have a body, like, so we have UL, UL actually works in Australia, too. Yeah. Do, do you have underwriter laboratories down there working on guidance for products? You know, like the, the router that you buy for your home, you know, home internet, for example, or, you know, cameras for your house and the, sort of the consumer grade stuff. Is there a lot of that? And, and is it, does it have any cyber hygiene or is it all pretty much, you know, scary stuff to plug into your network at home? Look, I'll be honest, I think it's definitely just, like, scary stuff. I don't <laughs> Thank you. Has, we agree, honestly. Has, I think there should be, and I think I think the big reason to get people to get that buy-in, honestly, it has to be if it affects them as, a, as an individual, then they're going to move. So if it impacts their, their family, their, mm. their social media, their privacy, their, their bank, then I think it's going to give people a reason to move because they have one then. Before, it's like, oh, who cares? Security's problem, no one really cares. It's an IT guy's problem. It's just sort of kicking the can down the road as a metaphor. But I think if we give people enough reasoning without scaring them, then I think people will absolutely, you'll start to see a massive hockey stick because of the adoption to this, because it affects them directly. Mm. Yeah. So the reward is security, but we have to convince them of that. We yeah. can't just scare them. And make it a, a state of mind. Right. But I like scaring them. That's my favorite. <laughs> I, I, I love it. How's that working? I think a lot of people do. Actually. Yeah, yeah. My, my favorite toy is the human mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm in favor of trying to, uh, you know, the carrot and stick approach. But uh, I don't know what the sweet spot is to, to tempt people to go this way. Let me give an example. There was a Republican congressman. Uh, just about two years ago, who was completely against uh, adoption of LGBT rights. And, okay. and then he found out his son was mm -hmm. gay. Okay. And then it affected him. And he changed, and he changed and he his position. And he completely changed the position okay. because it affected him. So this oh, is human there nature, you go. right? Right. Mm -hmm. so we, well, that's we Carissa's could, point, you know, if it, if it has to resonate with you as the user. Or, absolutely. Or, you know. We have to get that common resonance across the board. What's, what's going to play in, yeah. you know, is, does it affect your mom? Does it affect your kids? Yeah. Uh, IoT affects your kids. It affects us all. <laughs> well, we got one more minute. Chris, you want to do a promo for your company? Let's do a plug. Uh, yeah, so what, what do you want me to talk about? Just about, a little bit more about what we do as, a, as an organization? Yeah, definitely. If you want some business out here in the islands, give us a little plug. Yeah, yeah cool. So we're working with uh, companies all around the globe to help communicate their message better to their executives as well as to their customers in a creative way that's more engaging, palatable and digestible so people are willing to adopt their products and their services and again they get that that buy in and it makes them stand out from everyone else because security is such a dry industry so we help them stand out and really uh, take over their competitors wow awesome that's awesome what we need that here yeah we need that here <laughs> please come and i uh, guess some business in the islands we could really appreciate that okay well thanks for being with us carissa today aloha Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for being with me, brother. Yeah. All right. Hope so. to see you again. Right on. Thank you. Everybody, me. thanks for joining us on the Cyber Underground today. Um, I'm Dave, and uh, think of a new nickname for me. Go on to YouTube, watch the Cyber Underground, give me some comments, and tell me what else besides a cyber guy I should be calling myself. Uh, also, uh, season's greetings coming up. Um, aloha, everybody. 
Until the next time, stay safe.